Hey friends, so I'm going to talk about Bear and Sister Sandellas, commonly known under the common names, um, uh, well, the Gold Nugget and the Queen Gold Nugget, sometimes for L177. So it was described in 2011 in Neotropical Ichthyology, which I'll put the link in the description below. Um, so the genus is generally described or separated from other genus more easily by that membrane that attaches from the dorsal fin to the adipose fin, but it's not seen so much in Ancestrus beginii, which is also known as a blue panic. Um, it is shorter and it touches the pre-adipose plates, which are kind of like scales just before the adipose fin. It's a bit difficult to explain. So how is Baron Sistrus zandella separated? And it generally is by those spots and by the banding, but in 18 the banding can be restricted. So it does have those yellowish spots or sometimes more whitish and even more golden. It really depends on their number and the origin. And, and obviously the banding, which is larger in some than others. So there are three sort of L numbers included, technically four, and an LDA number. The L18 is the most common, and the adult form of that is L85. They tend to have the medium-sized spots and the reduced banding. Sometimes it's almost just about at the top of the dorsal fin and at the tips of the um, caudal fin. And then there's L70, L177, which is the typical one. So <laughs> one, the one a lot of people want. So it's got the largest spots and the largest banding. And in all of these, as that fish gets older, the spots get smaller, as do, does the banding. L81 wasn't actually included in the original description. And this has the smallest spots. And they tend to be what, more pale. And sometimes the fish isn't that solid black. It can be a bit more brown in coloration and that depends on its locality and is sometimes said to be affect how easy it is to care for so it's hardiness so the locality L18 and L177 come from the Volta Grande in the Rio Zingo and the Rio Irai and the L81 comes from south of the Rio, south Rio Zingo just south of Altamira so they're the L81 is further south and it wasn't included in the original description. Maybe that could have been, it is thought to have been maybe a mistake or it could have been for other reasons, but we don't really know. So the adult size varies between the two groups. So L18 and L177 will get to 24 centimetres standard length, so excluding the tail, whereas L81 will get to about 18 centimetres standard length, so that's also excluding the tail. They both tend to be deeper with age, and they are big fish, and most people don't see them big because they often die early in captivity. So what are the water perimeters they need? Well, generally, it's about 26 to 30 degrees, so you could keep them with high pancistrus. Now, I'm talking Celsius because I am in the UK. So they do prefer it higher than you would think for most um, plecos, but most plecos do prefer these higher temperatures anyway, almost um, hypostome. And they do prefer softer water with a lower TDA, TDS, so that would be about 6.5 to about 8, but 8 is quite high, so they are very tolerant of water conditions, really tolerant of that, as well, but they do prefer the softer water and I would advocate putting them in softer water. And now I'm going to talk about diet and that's the real thing that kind of hits you with this species. And they are evolved, their gut is evolved and has been shown to contain specifically ulfwich, which is a German word for, I believe, periplankton. So that's not floating stuff in the water like you'd think most plankton. Periplankton includes algae biofilms and invertebrates but they're not the same sort of invertebrates you'd think of for hypensistrous they don't have the gut for a more carnivorous diet instead they prefer softer algae biofilms which are very easy to digest and therefore also the protozoa and the only diets I'd feed them as a staple is the Vipashi Solent Green EBO um, I think it 
EBO spirulina, Pantare, um, Pantare's, um, I think it's called Ulfrich diet, and also the EBO sponge food. And I would go, if you're just going for the EBO ones, I'll get both of them, because all of these diets are more designed for those sort of fish. And the problem is a lot of Baronsistrus xanthellus and also a few other Baronsistrus die of malnutrition or starvation in captivity. They can be very difficult to acclimatise to a diet that a lot of us, a lot of fish keepers feed them. So algae wafers, they're not always going to take them. And I find it easier to feed them courgette at first. So get them onto that and then put the rapashi as well on a harder surface because I find they prefer to rasp. And they do tend to get, a lot of people, if you don't feed them the right diet, they will get stunted because they're getting malnutrition. They're not getting the diet they need and they will die early. They should be around the age of three, close to fully grown. So close to that 20 centimetre mark, standard length. So they are not a fish that I would recommend to people really. They are very difficult to care for, well feeding wise, is more getting them onto the food than anything. And their diet is very specific. So I would be feeding those foods and maybe, and trying other things as well. So a few frozen foods, um, tuber flex, but not in obscene amounts. Also sweet potato and just giving them a whole mixture because they need that range in their diet but they want those softer, more easy to digest foods. Um, so the setup, wood I prefer. They're in their natural habitat, they don't have wood, but wood I find, t especially bog wood, when you touch it, when it's been in the water a long time, it kind of like smears and is all dirty. And that is, in my opinion, I think that's the bacteria that's growing on it. So it will give a little bit of beneficial like addition to their diet is not something that's going to keep them going but they will be able to eat the bacteria that grows on the wood and um, you can keep rocks and you could even put the rocks in the light well in a bucket outside in the light especially in the summer just to grow some softer algae on they're not going to eat diatoms they've not got the mouth parts for diatoms they're not going to clean the tank um and that's the algae a lot of people have problems with. And blackbeard algae, you've got no chance of that. It's more the ones that are very soft and nice. <laughs> um, ones you generally don't get. And also filtration. So filtration, a lot of filtration. Like any pleco or any Laura filtration, you want flow. So you could do a sponge filter, but you want a lot of power going through that, or air going through the sponge filters. And I prefer externals, or I would like a sump on mine when I eventually have a racking system, a sump and also power heads. But unless you're breeding, I would recommend going with externals or going with a sump, um, even if you're breeding, going with a sump or externals. And generally, these are better if you're not as experienced with Laura Cardi, in my opinion. Difficulty. I think this is important to say just that they are difficult to get to feed. A lot of people don't have theirs for long. They should live for about 20 years. So they're not easy and it's their specific diet. Don't cheapskate. Get them the diet they need. And they can be sensitive. Some, they can sometimes be sensitive to water quality. They do come from the wild. They are wild caught. I think there has been people breeding them, but they are wild caught. So they're not... So it's better to sort of acclimatise them. And they are a brilliant fish. They are absolutely stunning. They do change as adults. Their coloration, they tend to, sometimes they will go yellow under certain conditions. Well, sort of yellow with the spots. And their banding does decrease and their spot size does decrease. So don't expect that baby fish you got to look the same as an adult, but bigger, because it doesn't. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, rate and subscribe. We're going to try and do a lot more as I go. Anyway, thank you.